To what extent do participants in projects of the Environmental Health Clinic tune in to the conflux of human and biotic systems? Or do you prefer to maintain the notion of encounter between two separate species? It's a very interesting and important question. I think that when someone swills a cocktail with a glass eel in it, and they see the little heart beating and the beginnings of the spine, and they name it and then they release it into the aquatic ecosystem, that's certainly an encounter. It's an intimate encounter, but it initiates the possibility of a relationship and the concern for the aquatic ecosystem as they swim up the East River into the Bronx River, get blocked by dams on the way, um, for what one can do with this wild pet, if you, if you will. So people may not extend their concern, but um, in the Cross Species Adventure Club of the Environmental Health Clinic, it gives a framework to recognize, assist, and facilitate ongoing systematic concern uh, and relationship to figure out what can we do to make this, to facilitate the healthy, happy, productive life of an eel that is so intriguing and wondrous in its own right. Um, when somebody wrestles a rhinoceros beetle, right, and the, the uh, encounter is certainly a, a spectacular moment, you know, to, be, to be actually feel the forces that are magnified. We actually step them up so that we amplify the rhinoceros beetle forces to human scale and human forces are scaled to beetle scale. So it's an even playing field, if you will. And so, yes, it's an initial encounter, but it does demand the questions if you enjoy it you know if a sport is built on wrestling with rhinoceros beetles then you have to have rhinoceros beetles around and what do they need and why are they so biomechanically impossibly strong why are they the strongest animals in the world you know because they churn up the the cellulose and they they aerate the soil and they contribute to the soil biodiversity in an extraordinary way. They appear in every biome, right? So these questions can't help but come up and the discussion can't help but come up with an encounter that turns into, or can, or might, or I would hope, turns into a systematic interrelationship where people are asking, well, what good is a rhinoceros beetle? You know, why would you, why would you wrestle a rhinoceros beetle? Is of course the first question I get. So. I very much think that with the irreducible complexity of urban ecological systems, I don't think we can provide a plan um, or prescriptions that here's the answer, but we can provide ways to experiment, to ask questions, these public experiments where, where we hold these things to be self-evident. If the biochar works, you can see the 40% um, the increase in growth and the greater biodiversity in the lawn, right? If the tree office works, it's because you've gone there and, tr and tried it out and thought, oh, this is actually the best working space <laughs> I've ever had, right? So it's, it's really about experiencing in small but concrete ways, experimenting with your own life and lifestyle, what works, what works very locally and then by demonstration there's an aggregating capacity so um, if you're wrestling a rhinoceros beetle someone else who you know, will, will want to do it if you're flying on a zip line across wetlands with 16 foot wings it's not that you're teaching people about the value of wetlands and distributed wetlands in an urban ecosystem for saving or providing habitat for frogs and, and salamanders. It's that, you know, you do have this encounter that you, the spectacle, the initial wonder that hooks people in. But I think the work of the Environmental Health Clinic is really to 
provide systematic framework for experimentation and the way to aggregate that, to recognize the diversity but to aggregate it so that anything you might do to improve the air quality or the water quality or the plant biodiversity or the soil biodiversity, the benefits are enjoyed by anyone you share that soil, air, water or food systems with. So it really asks people, asks participants to experiment with their own lives as art, for everyone to be an artist, for everyone to experiment with, does this work for me in my context, in my self-interest? But then I think the clinic's, the environmental health clinic job is to recognize and aggregate that, the small but evidence-driven, I would say very high standards of evidence, um, lifestyle experiments and public experiments to aggregate that into significant collective action into significant environmental remediation because that's that's the way we have to do it in this diverse evidence driven engaging convivial participatory way okay so I think the cultural legacy we're dealing with with the inherited environmentalism and systems thinking of kind of uh, Buckminster Fuller kind of Californian popularized idea that we can understand and control and um, systems thinking suggests systematic um, address and and I think there's an easy way in which systems thinking deludes us that we understand these systems that are irreducibly complex and have surprising and often unknowable consequences. Um, so it's a legacy that we can use, but I think reinvent this socio-ecological systems design where we set up you know, we take responsibility for what we design so we can set up feedback loops. So in the case of the amphibious architecture array, we, the fish learn that when the lights go on, food is likely to appear. People learn that when the lights go on, fish are likely to be there. And you set up a loop that um, can really aggregate into significant remedial um, remediation. However, you are still responsible for what is being fed, what are the consequences, how those, the, um, how the nutrients are being transported. To the extent that you can understand and trace it, you are accountable to it. And so that puts me in the position where, although I know that this is irreducibly complex, that could lead to a paralysis or crisis of agency of we can't do anything because you know the idea is that the idea of the inherited legacy of environmentalism is that do not touch leave no trace all you can everything you do is bad right and I would argue that we can do something we can make it good and the only way we'll figure that out is to poke these complex systems in ways that we earnestly think will work and then learn from that. Not knowing that we have the answers, but having sufficient confidence in the experiment that it will produce a desirable outcome that is willing to self-correct. So I think there's things to take from systems thinking that can produce a socio-ecological systems design where blame, credit is widely shared and blame is tightly focused. So. Okay. <laughs>
um, um, the countercultural, the ecological thinking, um, and uh, uh, as as the nature of the exhibition, I feel there are a lot of uh, archive materials um, and information and texts that needs to be very important aspect of the exhibition in order to understand the context. Um, and at the meantime, there are artworks, there are, there are artists being featured in the exhibition. Uh, there are a heavy component of Eleanor Enton's work, uh, which she, of course, um, plays with the idea a lot. Um, but uh, I guess my question is, how do you see the relationship between the artwork that being embedded among these piles of archive materials? Um, um, with the context of the exhibition and also with the heavily, uh, I would say, pedagogical information that is in the exhibition. Um, does artwork being in the process has been reduced into like a pure image which has information embedded in it uh, and the information is having connection with the rest of the material. Um, and uh, I think for a uh, research-based exhibition, um, it's very uh, evident that uh, a lot of the information has to be set up like this with panels and texts. Um, I'm, I'm also just wondering um, how do you consider the spatial experience and also the visual experience of the exhibition when the viewer has to read a lot of texts, uh, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, I guess uh, that, that's it. Okay, the relation between the archival material and the uh, artwork, uh, you could uh, start by clearly distinguishing two modes of display, two systems of display. Um, one is the commercial fair system on which these uh, in boards and monitors and also some works of art are uh, um, displayed and the other uh, is a hanging system um, which has different connotations. Uh, the connotations of the fair system are that it reminds slightly of kind of Buckminster Fullerian uh, utopian light transportable mm, uh, architectures uh, that have now become sort of uh, commercial uh, systems. Also global standard is in there, no? like uh, becoming a global standard as a kind of narrative component of what it means to universalize uh, a thought, but also a technology, a practice. Um, the art system that is hanging is uh, having a different connotation. Uh, that's more reminiscent of the uh, Family of Man exhibition display, which is a different moment of universalizing, but also a different moment of, of re or unframing. Um, because the entire the entire relation between people here is supposedly being reframed in the light of World War II uh, catastrophe, collapse of Western civilization, as it is sometimes called, uh, Auschwitz, Hiroshima. Um, Family of Man is a reconfiguration of, your, uh, of Western uh, modern universalisms. Uh, that now accept or propose somehow the big frame for everybody. And of course, the big question is what has become of this promise? It's an exhibition that has also been highly criticized for its implicit judgments and uh, framing conditions. The, and the, in that sense, it is carries already the same problematics as the blue marble image in a way, which is meant to uh, be an image for everybody, but at the same time, and um, an image without frame um, at the same time, tends to uh, obscure the very uh, privileged position from which it is taken and uh, um, that it of course is a framing condition and it matters. Th it's the most powerful frame is to say that there is no frame and when you are the one who says that. Um, the art in this exhibition is um, both celebrating itself as uh, uh, autonomous vectors uh, and is of course curatorially immersed in a narrative. Um, I strongly believe that if you do both 
uh, to the extreme, it's for the mutual benefit of everything. Um, not necessarily always, uh, but I would not believe in a narrative exhibition that would try at the same time uh, fetishistically to leave art uh, by itself in its own autonomy and so on. I also think that is part of a myth that I don't believe in anymore, at least not for thematic exhibitions. Uh, this is very different for the semiotics of a particular oeuvre by a particular artist and so on. Uh, where on other registers I would completely accept uh, uh, that, but uh, here it is, uh, the main focus is uh, cultural imaginary, cultural narration, history, um, in which the art can play very, very different roles. Sometimes it is exactly what I just said, like an autonomous breakthrough, you know, or you could see that an art, that art participates in a, in a trend, in a drift, in a, is afflicted, is infected, is pushing, a certain idea plays the avant-garde role or it's just redoing what's been done all the time, drawing circles, for example, becoming esoteric, um, embracing the psychedelic, all these things uh, where, yes, also sometimes art here is an utter symptom. Um, and that's uh, uh, certainly also a good challenge uh, um, as long as the, um, the implications of that are uh, treated in um, in a respectful, careful, and hopefully intriguing way. Okay. Yeah, yeah, come on, come on. Um, okay. So I have a question to Anselm Frank and Dietrich Dietrichsen, the exhibition curators of the Whole Earth Catalog exhibition. And having seen the show downstairs with them just now, it becomes quite apparent that being based on a publication or on a series of publications, the exhibition itself seems to be constructed very much like a book or a publication with the seven chapters, um, the scanned images of book pages, then you have the bibliographic references of books that are exhibited via their covers, um, images, reproductions, so on and so forth, and lots of text. So I'm just wondering, I'm curious, because I know that uh, at the end of June, there's a catalog coming out for the exhibition, which I was fortunate enough to translate some of the essays for. Um, and I'd, I'd be really curious to hear s a little bit about the concept of the book in relation to the show. Is there elements that they see or you see that the book is going to supplement towards the show or are you going to represent the show itself in the format of a book because it is already so book-like and maybe as a viewer you're going to have difficulties or uh, basic difficulties of bringing the time to sit downstairs and read everything and maybe you want to take that information and be able to have it at home and, and spend more time with it and go back to it continuously in the future. Or do you have a more conceptual and more experimental approach to the catalog where if you think that downstairs you created a book or you unfolded the show in terms of a book, do you fold in an exhibition maybe into the covers of a book with that publication that's coming out in a couple of months. Unlike uh, maybe a lot of curators and uh, uh, critics, uh, I guess particularly, um, I'm less afraid of exhibitions um, being close to books, uh, but that's also uh, um, part of the kind of attempt to find forms for, to use the exhibition space as a form of narration. Um, and it is never merely text, no? It's exactly about the relation between images and text in the way they determine the relation between them uh, defines a certain historical life, uh, historical life of both images and of ideas. Um, so, uh, when you see book covers uh, or, or books with their cover displayed as uh, um, as objects, then of course this is um, 
to uh, this is a way of uh, referring to a history of ideas and with a twinkling of the eye um, performing a, a slight little fetish function on the historical object um, because also most of these uh, covers are actually aesthetically extremely interesting and are part of an image because there is no such thing as a thought without an image uh, and exhibitions are great for exploring this image sphere in which the traffic between the two happens. Um, so the way I would conceive of the relation between exhibition and book um, uh, is that each has to function according to the its own medium. Um, now, uh, I say a few things about the book in a second, but first, the whole Earth catalog. Um, the interesting thing in the whole Earth catalog uh, by Stuart Brandt, which is one of the guiding motifs of the exhibition and where we borrow the title from, is that it's a sort of uh, archive of the counterculture um, and a kind of form of publication that attempted uh, to be a system in itself and not a linear narration or analysis of anything, but rather a kind of mail order catalog of a different kind, which in to quote would owe everything to the users and nothing to the producers. No? So kind of user orientation and access philosophy that has ever since become extremely important and, uh, and successful, of course, because uh, uh, it's some uh, basic idea of empowerment uh, to provide tools, access to tools is the subtitle of this um, thing. Now, the interesting thing is that you would maybe for those who do not know the catalog, it might almost appear weird that so much in this catalog is about discourse. In so many books um, that it's absolutely discursive. Um, yes, there's also uh, water purifiers, garden shovels, and uh, uh, early uh, IBM calculators or something like that to be uh, listed and uh, reviewed because it's the format of the short review that is kind of uh, placing these uh, objects or discourses in context and makes them useful for an assumed common goal which is the unideological reorganization of a democratic uh, capitalist society uh, at least it is never uh, desired to be explicitly non capitalistic in the whole Earth catalog, quite the opposite, but this is not in the foreground. Capitalism is basically something bracketed off most of the times. Anyway, um, to say that there is an assumed common horizon for a discourse, and uh, this common horizon is what we have to unearth today, uncover, uh, reclaim, I think, because it marks the horizon of um, capitalistic standards of the cultural imaginary today. No? So in a way, I, I would always attempt to do exhibitions about cultural imaginaries, and then anything could be part of this. Uh, in this particular case, it's because it's an exhibition about an ecological paradigm, and the big question mark of what that would mean. It just tells the story of one possible trajectory of dealing with and advertising, proclaiming the consequences of ecology. Um, hence the kind of thought space that is mapping discourses and also tries, of course, to make them very, very tangible. Um, that's why, why music is so crucial in this exhibition. Uh, and I think it has very, very strong images. There's no single thought that has not attached itself to an image. Uh, sometimes it's also only a thought image, of course, but mo in most cases it is also uh, uh, an image that can be looked at and that throws us back at a structural question and or thought and uh, um, and the book that we are the catalog that we are doing is in fact um, quite close to the exhibition um, but of course cannot benefit from two crucial things uh, in the exhibition uh, very very crucial uh, the moving images through which people fo to whom if you're not in the thought space sometimes it's difficult to get in right seeing Kubrick's Star Child next to James Bond's uh, rockets, Cold War rockets, immediately gets you into a, a certain uh, um, moment, a certain milieu, a certain set of, uh, you know, the historical distance allows you to see 
things as weird that were completely normal and so on. So small alienation effects, discoveries, but also familiarities, that's what you can deal with extremely well. Um, also, California, crucially, is a kind of historical uh, uh, topos in which uh, the image economy um, or the image sphere is being uh, uh, employed in, in new ways uh, through, uh, of course, Hollywood, uh, and then later the entire kind of uh, uh, Californian uh, lifestyle image uh, uh, industries, um, which binds together affect design uh, and uh, um, um, a, certain, a certain level of, you know, employing, like going beyond, sort of this was also a big counterculture goal, no? going beyond the, this coercive rationality. Um, now, in a uh, publication, we have to slightly move away from, since we do not have the song, you don't have, you don't have the sound of this is the end, my friend, um, which immediately makes you feel California and a moment and so on. So you have to do this slightly different, but then like through constellations of images and a more, a slightly more abstract uh, argument and structure, um, which is then of course what the exhibition does not have, namely a number of key essays that are uh, sometimes more uh, uh, associative, like I would say Norman Klein's essay, which is sort of written from a very implied perspective. Sort of I'm, I'm part of this and I'm part of also its problems and I'm struggling with certain paradigms or it's a very sober, precise analysis such as Fred Turner's uh, text written for the catalog on, on kind of notions of the total, uh, the whole. Fred Turner, who's a historian of the uh, cyber culture and has written a book uh, called From Counterculture to Cyberculture, which was also one of the sources for some of the, also some of the more novel connections that are not yet completely uh, well known. Um, in the so yes, it's for taking it home and working it out. And hopefully it's, uh, s hopefully the book is then the opposite of the exhibition, t at least in one simple sense, namely that in the exhibition you have to be enchanting and seductive because otherwise it would not work as an exhibition. Um, and this in the book has to be turned into um, in a more analytic principle that would hopefully be also at points challenging and even obscure so that it actually is something that needs, that has riddles, that needs to be solved, that needs to be, that one returns to. No? That books need to have a, a secret because else you don't take them out of the shelf again. Um, Uh, so this is a question for Anselm Franke through the mediation of the camera. Um, so the exhibition, The War Earth, uh, is about a time where um, while technology was supposed to close the circle uh, between man and nature, the image of the Earth rise uh, came to give a final reversal or turn of the screw to the movement of modernity. Uh, the rise of the subject um, above the horizon of nature uh, is entering into the sphere of uh, light and revelation history. This disappearance of the outside uh, the exhibition uh, invokes on the coast of, on the shore of California, uh, that the earth rise epitomizes, thus seems to echo another uh, disappearance uh, on another shore. Uh, the one that uh, Michel Foucault felt at the end of modernity, uh, the disappearance of the face of sand uh, man had carved for himself on the shore uh, of history. So according to Foucault, this face of sand uh, is the image of the process of modern uh, episteme. Uh, that is the instrument by which uh, the inside, the, the production of the subject, is actually what we could understand as a morphological process of the outside, making of the subject something like a wrinkle, uh, a fold, or a pocket reversal, a local pocket reversal of the outside. 
So if we follow Foucault, if we, we can understand that the epistemological discontinuity uh, Western modernity had established uh, between the subject and nature, uh, the shattering space of uh, critique uh, that dialectically bounds subjects and objects was in fact a continuous uh, process, um, which is precisely the question raised, I think, by the concept of Anthropocene, where the epistemological separation between the figure of man and its ground collapses and where consequently the linkage between the production of knowledge and criticism, uh, especially in the context of advanced capitalism, uh, is radically transformed. So your text in the catalog seems to end on this precise question of critique um, that indeed cannot bear the modern dialectics of inclusion and, and exclusion that kept it running. You even call for um, a vertical move back to the background of planet Earth. Um, since I think this is exactly the point of the thought of the Anthropocene, uh, I'd like to ask if you could be a little uh, more specific uh, on this question of the possibility to be critical uh, today, uh, especially when we think with art. So my question is the following. From your point of view, uh, in, a context, in a context where no one can say no to ecology, uh, would you agree to say that the main critical matter at hand for art um, is not an exploration or implementation of ecological modes of uh, relationality, but rather a uh, navigation in the main space the an Anthropocene opens that is to say, the, the remains of the epistemological separation modernity handed down to us? Okay, I think this is a very good question indeed. Um, and it is one that um, <coughs> I would always attempt not to necessarily answer uh, theoretical but um, with a certain practice a practice that may be f trying to focus on um, as we do in this exhibition the whole earth dialectical images um, so it is less about rescuing epistemological separations that modernity implemented um, then um, exploring um, or working at the meridian of dialectics, if you wish. And that also means to rescue dialectics, even if this word also comes with its own uh, baggage in which I would not buy into everything. I think... Um, the, the point is not to reject ecology, but to be very clear that we have no, not much models yet on what ecology means politically, other than that it used to be uh, or is invested with this interpolation power of, call w of closing the circle by means of some urgency, like uh, the kind of Peter Sloterdijk motive of change your life. Um, but the matter at hand seems to me um, very much how do we get to, um, to negotiate uh, structural conditions. And that is what I would mean by dialectics, the relation between a uh, articulation and the structure that produces it. And I think the critical point is not to fall into the trap of a complete negation because negation today takes place in an increasingly I would say probably clinical space um, but to try um, to uh, um, sort of move um, with the uh, with this idea of the what I was just just calling this meridian um, uh, trying to deal with the fact um, that, which is also part of, I guess, the thesis of this exhibition, uh, that we have not actually entered as the whole Earth 
image and its um, messengers, such as the whole Earth Catalog and Stuart Brand, were suggesting a period in which all boundaries and distinctions would break down, but rather the opposite. We have actually universalized the boundary conditions, and that is a very interesting motive, which will, I think, take quite a lot of time to uh, deal with. No? So it's a big difference to think of um, a, a space such as the one that you see in the exhibition announced by people like Stuart Brand or Russell Schweikart when he says in the outer, in the orbit of Earth, um, in awe, uh, inspired by this beauty and the fragility of this threatened but also harmonic uh, uh, planet, no frames, no boundaries. No? This the, um, in fact, it's a kind of universalization of the framing condition, which at the same time puts up new uh, challenges and questions to um, politics. And what is politics? Politics is about the entry condition into a sphere of, uh, uh, of negotiation and into a sphere of speech. Um, and into a, s a sphere of status, of subjecthood status, um, not necessarily in order to rescue Foucault's uh, uh, image in the sand, um, um, but simply um, as a subject of rights, yeah, as, because there is no such thing as uh, rights without a subject that bears it. Uh, so I would, in this moment, become less carried away by the, the, the kind of grand scheme, like the Foucauldian image of the image of man being washed away at the beach maybe of California under LSD, um, but try to insist on this, uh, um, that, that you know, the universalization of boundary conditions and that they, they're working at both macro and micro levels. Um, which we have to break open and the only way since in at least in a kind of curatorial fiction which is useful f to some degree uh, the only way to do so is to um, imagine that you know the the modern era of time has also reversed with the turning around of the camera and the, this meridian meaning the, the dialectical optics that uh, uh, is a kind of Benjaminian concept um, that allows you to see the very making of these boundaries um, as systemic conditions that they have become today, kind of the calculuses and milieu modeling that happens everywhere, um, that has to be unearthed, if you wish, um, by historical narratives, eh, kind of archaeology narratives, uh, such as the one uh, uh, of the shores of California in the, um, where the frontier morphs into circular form. So this is... Uh, um, part of the answer. On the other hand, in art, I would certainly um, do try to uh, do a double move. Um, on the one hand, um, art, which also since roughly 68 and what Jeff Wall calls the conceptual reduction has entered into this uh, by now kind of quotidian use, the concept of the, you know, the, the expanded field. So, uh, which often makes us forget that art still carries the systemic condition of modernity, but now transformed into mere quotation marks. Um, so it's no longer necessarily bound to a clear institutional demarcation with an inside and an outside. It could also be everywhere, and uh, so, but it's always with a quotation mark. So because if the quotation marks, for example, is not present, um, a calligraphy piece would be craft, while if it's qu quoted, it could enter a contemporary art biennale. These are the kind of systemic continuities that are absolutely crucial to understand and uh, see them in their historical continuity, um, which leads in my curatorial tendencies, um, yes, to a certain embrace of um, modernist concepts of the institution, simply because I, I think that these are the systemic conditions under which art takes place now, meaning I would not necessarily embrace or do projects which further claim to expand and uh, transgress, but I would rather try to use, yes, the exhibition and the institution as purifying uh, machines in which it could, the only really amazing thing we can still do with these quotation marks and the institutional frames is th to actually um, uh, over-determine uh, signifiers, to enter a semiotic field where the smallest little detail um, is 
matters and forces you uh, ideally in some way or another connected with an e entire uh, set of ex aesthetic experiences which is part aesthetic experience is absolute part of boundary conditions because it's exactly about the nexus of making and being made and uh, um, the entire affliction and affection of a body um, just as much as it is about uh, ideas um, and ideologies. Um, so I would uh, embrace a certain uh, um, purifying uh, um, quality which one could say is in, in continuity. Uh, I think that the, the key questions also in, in, uh, in other fields, uh, in part parts of the sciences is not to completely give up on purification models and resolve everything in a not further qualified relationality, sure. Um, so the question is just at what moment does it politically do what, to what effects do we use certain tendencies such as is it at the given moment where basically we enter a field that is not defined by, r uh, by r uh, uh, very uh, restrictive distinctions, but rather by things like systemic privilege. Huh? Um, so I would uh, at the same time try to uh, work very strongly against this, uh, what, what, in what both in uh, other fields and in art has become systemic privilege, which is all about continuous forms of in and exclusion, but no longer easily addressed and named as such. Uh, so this uh, double move uh, would probably be another dialectical motive, embracing the, the modern purification heritage of institutions, um, breaking them on the content level as in archaeology along the meridian of uh, dialectical constitutions of expressions, articulations, and uh, uh, structures, and uh, at the same time um, trying to negate systemic privilege simply for the sake of being able to uh, address and negate and take distance and be autonomous towards the very structures that create these privileges. My question is addressed to Birgit Ahrens, um, Curator of Contemporary Art at the Natural History Museum in London. And I would like to know in relation to our discussions this week, um, what object you would propose for a museum of the Anthropocene, please. Okay. Um, thanks for the question, Alice. Um, museum of the Anthropocene. Um, I would propose an object from, or if I could be greedy, I would propose two objects. I must put, um, because there's so many things that uh, one could look at. I think it's quite a lot we can physically transport into a museum like that. I think it'd be quite a vast collection, really. But just to give one example, is there's an object at the Natural History Museum, and it's called the Calendar Rock. Um, it's in a, in a collection which is actually accessible. You can, you can look at it, you can touch it, and um, quite a large piece like this. And it's um, black and white very simple and uh, it's called calendar because it shows us in the striations of the rocks which have been compressed over thousands of years um, that um, we have got these striations naturally occurring but then um, from the 18th 19th century onwards we can see that uh, how we affect the um, the the planet and these um, and there were very fine striations, very fine black and white, sort of a bit denser for about this sort of size. And then we have got a, a, a fatter stripe, which is white, and it indicates the week. Um, the, the rock comes from a coal mining area, and it shows the layers of coal mining dust that settled over this rock and was then compressed later on. So we have got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday work in the coal mine, Saturday, Sunday, there's no work going on, and so we've got a we've got a, a wider white stripe, and then this carries on as of a as of an area like this, which in a rock which is of this size, and um, it indicates labor. It indicates how we're mining the earth, the the um, elements we need for our energy-hungry society, coal. But also it shows us very directly how we've been over the the past two centuries overlaying the earth with the degrees of pollution which are inscribed in the geological record. So I think a really beautiful object. If I may add another one, 
because I really like to bring in mean, um, also the, um, the, uh, the culture of making. And so um, I've only seen this object in reproduction, but it's in the World Cultures Museum in Liverpool. And is a, uh, a rice bowl from, from Japan, from Hiroshima. And when the atomic bomb was dropped onto Hiroshima in, in, um, in August 1945, uh, there's been this massive man-made event, something that couldn't have happened without the engineering of humans. This moment of the atomic bomb explosion caused this rice bowl to fall onto the ground. And the ground was made of a soil in this particular case. And under this instant heat, the, um, the rice bowl fused with the soil because the soil spontaneously under the heat transformed into glass. And um, so the glass and the ceramic of the, of the, uh, of the um, rice bowl are forever fused together. And that would be the other project object that I will put in and that would be the beginning of an of a Anthropocene Museum project, I think. I have the question for uh, Jens, that during the talk given at Synapse, the artist Agnes Meyer Bandit, she has mentioned that by going between art and science, particularly biology, she can kind of like extend the human senses to reach the, um, the remote uh, reality. And I think this term of remote uh, reality is quite crucial that um, it changing the understanding of aesthetics in terms of practicing and perceiving art when art becomes like a kind of um, synchronizing set of uh, biosemiotics. Uh, so I have, I'm curious that um, how can curator as the exhibition maker can go beyond the representative quality of the art and the artwork, as you mentioned, the kind of like metaphysics uh, level of uh, the art and biology. Uh, how can they go beyond that representation to uh, convey the full biosemiotics within the artistic context, which is still the aesthetics context. Yeah. The question is, as I understand it, what is the specific possibility of conveying a feeling of this remote reality while the artistic procedure and process is in fact multi-scaled. It involves, in Agnes Meyer Brandes' works, the work with the real geese, raising them and printing them, carrying out actions, teaching them, uh, building subchapters and linking them in a kind of meta-narrative network. And uh, of course, on the first side, this of course deals and implies living organisms for which the artist has to take over responsibility. There is a lifelong commitment to the skis because they can outlive the artist. So it's really a project that in the terms of scale, in terms of geographical, uh, physical, and on temporal scale, is exploding the notion of what we consider usually as art, that make, means the condensation, the mesoscopic condensation as an experimental space that people can encounter in an exhibition, for example. So. Um, very often, I think that in biotechnological artworks, which very often are small, the very effect, the presence effect that one can feel as a human observer, observing another living system, um, in fact goes back to a very crucial uh, relationship that Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela has described as the situation of a second of a order observation, that means I am a human being, and as a human being, I'm looking at the living system. And this living system is very similar to me as an observer, who I am also a living system. So one living system is looking at another one, and therefore I can experience what I call a co-corporal uh, presence, a co-corporal relationship. So this is something I think that very often biotechnological art has as a potential. But in the case of Agnes, of course, this is more complicated because um, yeah, you won't visit the geese at this Polinaria farm. 
you have glimpses, you have excerpts, and you have a kind of exploded artworks that splits up into documentary and fetishized remains, which reminds us very much on, of how performance art worked. You know, you had the images of the performance, maybe some remains, some fetishized remains that you collect, your photographies, but you haven't been at the very moment of the action. You know? So it's again mm, asking the question whether the image be it a document or being even a representation is strong enough to convey this, this feeling that um, I'm really acknowledging the living as a living and not as something that is just reduced to the status of an aesthetic object. Uh, when it comes to biosemiotics then, I think that is very interesting um, that while seeing the anthropomorph anthropomorphized geese as astronauts, as the very agents of their own destiny in relation to the human in an interspecies relationship, that in indeed it provides a kind of mirror of the thinking out of the box and thinking yourself out of uh, this uh, human-centered cosmos where the Anthropocene is the result of an anthropocentric action. And maybe biosemiotics, which is another topic that I address, um, is a way out when we think of that uh, biosemiotics considers all elements of the living cosmos as equal. It's a very tiny scale of a microscopic intervention. That means cell communication, bacterial communication on our scale of uh, individual action, of talk, but also on the psychosocial level as populations. So there is nothing that can be excluded and humans do not stand out. We are just another um, producer of biological science in the semiocosmos. And I like this because also it shifts like biosemiotics to us, the uh, center of attention from information to interpretation. Uh, ho all, all the discourse in biology in the last years was very much about information theory, which is close to cybernetics. And um, at the scale of the molecular intervention, we always talk about information, information theory, the gene informs the cell and so on. And the biosemiotics uh, approach thinks the other way around. It doesn't matter so much how they inform. What is important is that something is being read and understood. And making sense in the terms of semiosis, this way it just simply means it lives. And only when it's rightly interpreted, then it can be living. So I like this uh, approach of biosemiotics. And I think Agnes works in a certain way does deal with it because it shifts totally the focus of attention to a kind of initiator, which often is technologically defined as a human one, to a passive material of the outside ecology on which we imprint our actions and to make us all equal in the light of biosemiotics.